Welcome to LifeSpring Church. We hope you enjoy this message. To find out more about LifeSpring Church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifeSpring UK. But it is a privilege. So, um, so I'm going to talk. Hopefully, um, slides and everything will work. Um, but yes. Um, I'm talking on dealing with offence, which is a topic that applies to absolutely every one of us. I don't think any of us can go through life without coming up against stuff that hurts us and we've got to deal with. Um, But I want to, my sort of little line underneath is um, becoming more like Jesus because... um, that, you know, we, when we get born again and we um, give our lives to Jesus, he comes and lives in us by his Holy Spirit. And then if we are willing, um, the rest of our lives, he will spend, uh, we will spend with allowing him to make us more like Jesus. And so I want to talk kind of in the context of that. So it's because he takes us up higher and... Um, Actually, we can't deal with offence very well on our own, in my experience, um, and I think most of you will, will agree with that. And uh, actually, he wants to take us up higher. So, uh, becoming like him. Um, I've been on a bit of a journey with this because um, I think it was in November, uh, we were in a leaders' meeting, and, and I said I thought it might be good to have some teaching on this subject. Don't ever say that to Neville, because then he says... <laughs> so he sort of said, well, you prepare something. And anyway, it's been a, a long time uh, for various reasons. Um, and I think God's been teaching me some stuff, which hopefully will be a bit helpful to you. Um, but during that period, sort of early in the new year, I started reading um, a book called Renovation of the Heart. Very, it's Dallas Willard, very thick book, very deep book. You can, I could only read like two pages at maximum at a time because there's so much to process. Um, but there was some really helpful stuff in there. So I'm going to start with a quote uh, from, from there. Um, where Dallas says, the most important thing in life is the person that we become. Um, and how, how do we become a different person, or how do we, how do we get changed? And actually, we're, we are being formed by whatever we give power to, by what we give our time and our energy to, and what we focus on. Um, yeah, I mean, that's very challenging, actually, when we think about what we spend our time thinking about, looking at, listening to, um, because all of that can be forming us, influencing us, affecting us, so we, we need to be really careful. In Galatians, uh, Paul talks about um, about... Actually, he describes it as about being in pains like childbirth, for that Christ be formed. He's writing to the Galatian church, that Christ be formed in you. And he was so longing to see it because we can look at ourselves, like we look at ourselves and we, we can, when we're being really honest with ourselves, we can recognize how selfish or mean or grumpy or irritable or, you know, whatever, whatever word you want to in there. And sometimes when you look at church and you can be aware of difficult stuff um, in church and kind of think, you know, we've got, a, we've got a long way to go. But God loves the church. He absolutely loves the church. Um, but Paul says he was in pains like childbirth that Christ be formed in us. So that's where we're going. I hope, you know, as many of us as um, are in that place to do that is, you know, Jesus, please continue that work in me. Go a bit deeper. Help me become more like you. Challenging first to pray because he tends to do it by taking us through difficult things. When um, uh, Angeline spoke on suffering and she was talking about being 
uh, like gold, you know, and she talked about the oyster, didn't she? Grit in the oyster, and that's, you know, all of that is how we get formed. So don't get frustrated when life is difficult, when you have reactions to stuff. Actually, it's an opportunity for Holy Spirit to work and change you. Um, next scripture is, which should come up on the screen, is Ephesians 4:24. Put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's put it on. It doesn't happen just like that. You have to choose it. You have to engage with this stuff, this process of when difficult stuff happens. It's a choice. We do, it just doesn't happen naturally. The more time we spend in God's presence and He softens our hearts then, you know, that really helps. But we do have a choice to put on uh, that new self. So, how we deal with offence is really important because thinking about who we become, if we don't actually deal with offence, it's easy to get hard, to get cynical, and to get bitter. And those sort of Christians aren't very attractive to be around. Um, I don't want to be like that, but it can be so subtle how our hearts can become a bit hardened. Um, and, I, you know, even as I'm speaking this morning, I'm just, Holy Spirit, please would you just be softening hearts. Hebrews 12. Verse 14 to 16, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no, one's fall, no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So when we get hurt, somebody offends us, it can be a bit of a reality check because it can show us the state of our heart because sometimes we can have a quite a strong reaction. Sometimes it can be a totally out of proportion reaction. We can want to get even. We can sometimes tear into somebody. Um, we can re retaliate. We want to be proved right. Um, we can feel justified in certain behaviors because we feel we've been wronged. And this is another little quote from Renovation of the Heart. Um, I don't think it's on the screen, but... Um, to accept with confidence in God that I do not immediately have to have my way releases me from the great pressure that anger, unforgiveness, and the need to retaliate impose upon my life. I'm going to read that again. To accept with confidence in God that I do not immediately have to have my way releases me from the great pressure that anger, unforgiveness, and the need to retaliate impose upon my life. So, you know, when something happens, it can put a huge amount of pressure because we can have this a very strong immediate reaction and we generally want to get things sorted straight away. Um, and we usually want our way, what we think is right. <laughs> but actually, getting to a place of not needing to have it your way really takes the pressure off. And I think learning to not react but to respond is really important and Holy Spirit can help us with that because one of the fruits of the, the Spirit is self-control. So he can help us in the moment to hold back, to have self-control, not to need to get it sorted in the moment and actually to allow him to do a process within us. We had, um, I can't remember what the subject was, I think it might have been when we were I think Neville was speaking about the Holy Spirit. And one of the life group questions after was about what makes you lose your joy? I don't know if any of you remember that. And my immediate 
response was when something happens with one of my children and they're finding life difficult, that really makes me lose my joy. But when we were discussing it in life groups, somebody said, when I don't forgive someone, and I think, yeah, that is so true. When we are in unforgiveness, we lose our joy we, and we lose our peace, both fruits of the spirit. Um, it can hinder our prayers and um, it can stop healing. So actually, as I'm just believing that Holy Spirit will just, in this talk and later on, hopefully you might think, think about it or think about it in life group, that as Holy Spirit highlights things, and helps us to deal with unforgiveness, I believe God can bring healing. He wants to heal our bodies. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute so that we can really be in the place, best place to receive from God. And actually when we've got this stuff that we're, and we're not processing it, and sometimes we can take a while, and sometimes it is, depending on what the issue is, it can yeah, it understandably takes a while to process, but it can be a blockage to receiving healing. So, going back to becoming more like Jesus. So, just remembering it's what we focus on. So, let's have a little look um, at things that Jesus said or that are said um, in God's word about this topic. And We've just finished 1 Peter, but just to go back to, this is this verse has been with me for a few months, um, and I found it really helpful. It's 1 Peter 2, verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So much of the Christian life is about trust. And actually, when we're taking stuff in our own hands, it, it's a good sign we're not trusting God. It's really hard to trust God stuff and you can feel like oh I've got it down in that area of finances maybe and then something happens and you think oh I've got to trust him in this area too he, he knows what you need he knows he knows your heart he knows how difficult you find certain things and you can trust him but it's not easy to make that choice because it means actually letting go of some of the ways we want to deal with stuff. So when we are hurt or angry, we are tempted to defend ourselves. But he who did no wrong, he didn't even open his mouth. Jesus did not even open his mouth. He, he would have had the best defense of anybody, but he did not even open his mouth when he was insulted. Matthew 18 is, we'll look at a couple of little sections from that. That's a really, um, it's all about unforgiveness, dealing with forgiveness. And Jesus has just spoken about forgiving your brother. And then in verse 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 21 to 22, Peter asks Jesus, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, I think he was thinking, yeah, he's seen how Jesus treats people and he thinks seven times is a lot. And Jesus says, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. And really he's saying indefinitely, infinity, you just gotta keep forgiving. And why do we do that? Because that's what Father does. Father keeps forgiving me. He keeps on forgiving. He keeps on forgiving you. Keeps on and on forgiving. Doesn't stop. Doesn't, he's not hard to win over. He's not, his heart isn't hard towards us. He doesn't hold a grudge and take a while to 
kind of allow us back into his good books, he forgives. And there's a verse, a little verse in Micah, chapter 7, that says, God delights to show mercy. Wow, aren't you glad we serve a God like that? He delights to show mercy. Psalm 103, very familiar one, says he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Then how much more should we not do the same? So, um, I'm not sure where I am on my slides. If you could put the one about state of my heart. So, yeah, what is the state of my heart? We can't avoid experiencing offence as we go through life, but we can choose how we respond. There was a book that was going around a number of years ago by John Bevere called The Bait of Satan. And he said, you know, offence. It was all about offence, and it's the bait of Satan. You know, when we get offended, it's like the enemy has got a worm on a hook and he's dangling it right over you. And it's so easy to take it. It's so easy to take the bait. But actually, you know, God takes it really seriously how we deal with each other. And he takes it personally, how I treat you or how you treat me. Um, and he also, when he, he talks about when we come into his house and when we come to worship, he'd rather we go and sort out the offence. He doesn't... He's, he doesn't, I mean, he loves our worship, but he'd much rather we sort out the state of our heart and deal with what's in it. And actually, there's scriptures, which I haven't put on the screen, but whether you are the offender or the offendee, we both have a responsibility <laughs> you to go to that person um, and sort it out. So let's look at different sorts of offences. Um, three, three types of offences. Um, there we go. Minor offences. These do a great job of revealing the state of your heart. That's where you get an overreaction. And it's really something quite small. And you just have a really strong reaction. And, you know, often that can be when you're tired or dealing with other challenges and you overreact. Um, but it shows what's in your heart. Also, it can, when there's something where we have an overreaction, <laughs> it can often be that we've had similar stuff in the past and there's still wounds there that we haven't dealt with. So actually, when, when we see a response in our hearts, it's an opportunity for more healing for us because God, again, it's a process of becoming more like Jesus but also becoming more healed, set free from the stuff of our past, and honestly, it, I mean, it's a lifelong journey, and it, <laughs> and it can be really hard because you can think when you have a response and you react to something and you think, oh, that's, that made me remember this, or it made me, or that was stuff that I brought back of what happened in my childhood, and you think, I can pray about this many times, but it's just another layer, and it's a, just a little bit more freedom and healing. So try not to get discouraged when that happens. It's an opportunity for deeper healing. But with minor offences, let's not make big things out of little things. You know, we got everybody's got enough going on in life that let's keep little things little. It's that bait. You know, let's not make big th big things. Let's give it each other grace. Let's be patient forbearing with one another. You don't know what else somebody else has got going on in their lives that has caused them to be thoughtless or a bit rude or whatever, you know. But let's keep little things, little things. And um, we don't always need to go and talk to a person. I think it's good if, you know, we're, where we can choose just to bring it to the Lord, say that hurt me, but I'm choosing, I'm not going to hold on to it. If you can't let it go, 
without talking to the person, then it's really important to, to do that, to go to the person and just say, actually, I felt really hurt by what you said or did. I felt really hurt. And, and you just say it um, with a desire for re reconciliation, not a desire to make them feel bad, not a desire to make them pay, but to just for reconciliation so that the enemy can't get in. Because the problem is we can end up keeping a bit of a record of wrongs. Um, so the other thing in thinking about becoming like Jesus, um, the scripture in 1 Corinthians, very well known, 1 Corinthians 13 on love, you know, God is love. Jesus showed that, lived it out, and, uh, you know, love is patient and love is kind. It keeps no record of wrongs. How often do I keep a bit of a record of wrongs? That shows the state of my heart. If somebody does something and then I'm adding it to the list, I haven't forgiven them. <laughs> I'm keeping a record of wrongs, but love doesn't do that. Second, lots, uh, second um, offences are legitimate wounds. So these can be deeper, harder things uh, where we are, have been really hurt or betrayed or let down. Um, and it can take a little while to work through. And I think it's learning to be honest with ourselves about how much something has really affected us because we can want to pu push stuff under the carpet and we can have a reaction and then just think, well, there's nothing I can do about it, move on. But underneath there, is, there can still be pain and unforgiveness. And so we need to be honest with ourselves. Um, and there should be another slide now. Um, yeah. So normally when we have an angry response, normally that's a secondary emotion and it follows hurt. We get hurt, upset, disappointed, rejected, whatever. That covers a whole lot of different things. We get angry, then we can be resentful and bitter. And if we don't deal with it, it's going to come out somewhere. And it, it may come out in fairly immediate aggression, violence, passive aggression, it may come out in illness, it may come out in our body, in psychosomatic illness, it may come out with tummy troubles or headaches or migraines or all sorts of things. Um, so actually when we deal with that, you know, let's believe for some healing. Or it can come out in depression or other sort of um, mental health issues. De uh, depression can be anger turned inwards. And, when, and until we're really honest with ourselves about what we're carrying, we can't really deal with it. So, um, yeah, so this, this can take a bit of work. We may need to grieve over something that we've lost, but we need it to make a choice to forgive. And giving forgiveness for something that is... You know, forgiveness isn't saying something is okay, it's for saying that really wasn't okay and that has damaged me, that's hurt me, but I'm not going to hold on to it and I'm going to give an undeserved gift, just the same as Father has given me an undeserved gift. So this, these ones, you probably will need to go and talk to the person, but you need to do it in when it's safe to do so, in a way that it's safe to do so when you're not angry, or if it is a very difficult relationship or, and there's a whole area of trust. trust. Forgiveness is not trust. You don't have to tr trust a person who shouldn't be trusted, but we do need to forgive. So you know, might need help to get a bit of wisdom about actually how do I resolve this. Here, um, here's another little quote from Renovation of the Heart. And this, this little subheading was abandoning outcomes to God. We like to have a fixed outcome. We like to be like, um, that needs to happen and I want to see that happen. Accepting that we do not ha have it in ourselves 
in our own heart, soul, mind, strength, the wherewithal to make this come out right, whatever this is. And actually just, again, it's trusting God. I can't necessarily make it come out how I want it to be, but I'm going to do what he settles in my heart to do, and I'm going to trust him with the outcome. We entrust himself to him, again, who judges justly and who deeply cares for us and knows our every need. And then the final area is life-shattering injustices. And I, some of you will have already had to deal with that. Thankfully, I haven't, and I hope most of us don't. But some people really sadly do. Um, and it might start with just wanting to want to forgive. Um, and without God, I don't think we can. But it's kind of recognizing, I think, with all of this, it's recognizing that God has given us mercy. We, so we want mercy for ourselves. It's very easy to want justice for somebody else. <laughs> but we can't have it both ways. Um, so just some final scriptures. Um, uh, the final one from Matthew. Thank you very much. Matthew 18, this is again. So this is, this is the end of a, the story about where um, a, a servant um, owed a huge debt, huge debt and that he could never pay back and would have had to go to prison if he couldn't pay it back. And the master released the debt and then the servant is owed a very small amount of money by somebody else and he goes and gets him by the throat and it says pay me everything everything uh, that you owe and then this is the response at the end of this chapter which is really sobering then the master called the servant in you wicked servant he said I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. Wow. And that's really sobering, isn't it? And I think we so need Holy Spirit to help us with this, with this stuff. I certainly can't do it without him. Um, and I'm just going to finish with just reading a little story of one of those life-shattering injustices, forgiveness. And, um, you know, as I do, it's just, Holy Spirit, please would you just touch our hearts. This is, this is such an area, Lord, that we find difficult, and I think we probably always will find it difficult, and we need your help. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would touch our hearts that you would help each of us to see how much we've been forgiven ourselves and that you would give us a grace to forgive and keep on forgiving. In Jesus' name. So, um, this is a story of Dick, whose son was shot dead by a drug dealer who had mistaken his son for someone who owed him money. The police caught the young man who, who pulled the trigger and he went to prison. He got justice, but that didn't bring Dick's son back. Dick was being eaten up, constantly turning over the events in his mind while mourning the death of his son. He felt such anger towards the person who had taken his son's life away. But one day God spoke to him and said, Dick, there is only one way you're going to be free. You're going to have to forgive. Of course, Dick protested, but they don't deserve to be forgiven, Lord. But God replied, I know Dick, but neither did you. This turning point enabled Dick to travel on a new road towards forgiveness. The road was long and hard, and space doesn't permit me to tell all the details. But one day, Dick finally got to the point where he knew he had to forgive the young man who had murdered his son, and he was willing to do so. He decided to write a letter to the young man in prison, and he enclosed a New Testament. For his part, the young man in prison was full of remorse 
and later recounted how he tortured himself daily with the question, why did I do it? He knew he had ruined his life. He sought some kind of solution by going to the prison chapel, but he wasn't getting anywhere. He even prayed for forgiveness, but the heavens were brass. He just could not see how God could possibly forgive him for what he had done. But then he received Dick's letter, which read, I am the father of the young man you murdered. I want you to know I'm a Christian and that I forgive you for what you did. Dick's words so broke this young man that he fell on his face and wept. Against lawyer's advice, Dick and this young man began corresponding with one another. They wrote to each other for a long time until one day Dick decided he wanted to go and visit him in prison. In due course, a meeting was arranged which would take place in the prison chapel. On the day they met, Dick's opening words to his son's killer were, I'm the father of the young guy you shot and I'm here to wash your feet. At this, the young man broke down and wept. I can't let you wash my feet, he protested. But Dick insisted, explaining, you need to understand, I need to do this for my own healing, so please let me wash your feet. That day in the prison chapel, both men washed each other's feet, weeping together as they did. Later, Dick was able to tell me, you know, John, that boy has become like a son to me. God has so changed him. He's no longer the same guy who pulled the trigger. He's been forgiven, redeemed, and God has renewed him. So if Jesus has accepted him, how can I not accept him? Thanks for watching this message. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. To find out more about our church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifespringUK.